I heard yesterday the talk already. I won't go once more through the ac um, active noise control and echo cancellation slides. Because these are exactly the same I showed yesterday. And we'll look into some of the newer topics. In fact, MPEG-H was already one of the newer topics. I put it in connection to the MPEG audio standards, but it's a system for immersive audio. <clears throat> but first, let's look for the field of music information retrieval and why that could be interesting and important. So, I usually start that with a slide uh, we stole from a Star Trek fan site, and which uh, shows what people at this fan site thought uh, spaceship uh, control room sh could look like. And sometimes uh, looking around, I have the feeling that uh, high fidelity equipment uh, these days looks the same. With uh, tons of controls, whether on a, a web interface or physical controls, and yeah, not really clear how to use it, what to do. So, that's a dream. In fact, I've been dreaming this for a long, long time. And uh, we've found that certain parts of that became true and are available today, and others not so much. So the dream is, if I come home and want to listen to music, first I should really feel like in the concert hall. There's again this dream of the ultimate high fidelity, perfect sound reconduction. But then again, the question is, how do I find my favorite music? Now, I asked this question yesterday. There we had one person, anybody here with more than one terabyte of music at home? No, <laughs> he's no longer in the room. But there are more and more people who got that much. And in fact, if you use one of the streaming services, whether it's Spotify, uh, Google, Amazon, or whatever, you have direct access to millions of tracks. So how do you find what you would like to listen to? There's this old dream of query by humming. Humming a melody, the computer recognizes it, tells me, okay, here it is. Like da 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 da. Okay, a lot of people will recognize already from this short excerpt that this could be Beethoven. And then the system will tell me, okay, and in my database I have 273 versions of this. <laughs> Which one do you want to listen to? I can look for genres, I can search. Uh, I can, if I want to download, look for my favorite portal to do that. It should be even simpler. I want to be able to tell my home stereo, please play me some of my favorite music, but nothing I listened to in the last two weeks because that would be boring. Okay, we get all these problems of it has to store what I listen to at the different devices. How does it do it? Uh, there's even more possible problems in a family, like my favorite music to different members of the family might mean very different types of music, and so on. So, speech recognition still is always on the way, like it looks like it will be able to do it, but in the moment I think we still can't ask that question. In fact, uh, last time I asked Siri uh, whether it can recognize music or can play music, it said, no, I can't. Uh, in fact, I asked the question four times, and the fourth time it answered with Hänschen Klein. <laughs> not singing, but just saying that. Okay, 
Recognizing music, as I said yesterday, scientifically is solved, but that's the first widespread application of these music information retrieval technologies. So we'll get into a bit more detail how that is done. Query by humming, as I explained less yesterday, is more for games. So it makes a lot of sense. It can tell me how good I am in singing. Uh, but it can't be used to recognize one melody from a few million available melodies. And mostly not because of the accuracy of the actual melody recognition, but because of the limited accuracy of people remembering tunes. Of course, musicians will have no problem. <laughs> but other people, it's not so easy. Okay. Music information retrieval is one of these fields, like audio coding, with a limited but growing number of labs over the world doing this research. So there's work in Barcelona at Queen Mary University, uh, several places in Germany, including us in Ilmenau, and there are a number of commercial services including GraceNote, oh, they don't longer, they were bought by Sony but sold again, so they are no longer Sony. There's the Econest, Apple Genius, Muffin, and so on. So, in fact, some recent number, 46 streaming services with up to 35 million tracks. We got the music identification, but we got new types of instruments as well like sound prison, uh, which you can find on the Apple uh, <coughs> App Store and which uses a lot of basic knowledge from musicology to give you a user interface which makes it much easier to play nice sounding pieces of music. Of course, if you want to become an artist on this type of instruments, you have to practice again. But as I don't know how many people we have here who try to learn an instrument when they were young, often for quite some time, this doesn't sound that well. <laughs> so a lot of people get deterred by, oh, I don't want to be responsible to reproduce such fake music, and then sound prison can help with that. Okay, we have different tasks in there. We have the audio identification, but we have the singer identification, for example, as well. Who is singing that? Which group is it? Then the old idea, wouldn't it be nice to go back, we all know scores are used by musicians to produce music. Can't we go back all the way, having a recording of music and produce score from that? That's called automatic transcription. And the good news is there was a jump in the state of the art some 10 years ago. So nowadays that works much better than I thought it would be possible. It's not perfect, but it's really quite nice. Then there are the questions, what is similar music? Especially for assembling, automatically assembling a playlist. Um, we know it's not just similarity. If I take these 35 million songs and start with one as a seed song and find the ones which sound much the same, it will become boring very, very soon. But we need to have some idea about what are the characteristics of some song. And again, as in other cases, that can of course be done by manual annotation. That's the metadata. And there are projects, for example, what Pandora is using, where they have hundreds and thousands of people annotating. In fact, this area was the 
uh, first one to use what we today call crowdsourcing. GraceNote uh, has this large database where you see DDB, uh, which from the length of the tracks can recognize a CD and give you all the metadata. That was started with if the CD was not known, asking people to write it in themselves and do the upload. So there's always a lot of crowdsourcing and people manually annotating, but there's a lot of cases where we want that to be done by the computer. Yeah, and then in the end, how to organize my music, especially genre and style, and there we have the problem that even humans don't agree on what a genre is. So how to test if we have no clear ground truth, no clear answer. That's the task of audio classification. Today, these systems, if they are computer-based, mostly follow some of the basic paradigms uh, of machine learning. And that is we start with some signals, in this case, of course, the audio signal. We get to some feature space. And we'll see there are different wordings for feature spaces. In fact, for all this metadata, organization, technology, there's MPEG-7, which originally uh, did a lot of work um, to have metadata and ways to automatically extract metadata for all kinds of media, not just audio. So we have a feature space. We might need a feature space reduction, dimensionality reduction. Um, in all these cases, the task is to recognize something in the same way a human does. So we start with some ground truth, with some manual annotation, and we compare to that. Which by itself sounds like a clear and easy task. It is not. Because even if the result in some sense is well defined, people doing the annotation will do, make errors. Much more often, it's not just errors. It's really different opinions. People have different ideas what constitutes a certain genre of music. There's different granularity. Like some people say, OK, we have pop music and we have uh, classical music. Oh, no. So-called e-music has lots of different genres and evolving over the years and so on. Uh, so with these techniques, we nowadays are able to do things like having some piece of classical music and do a quite nice um, uh, detection of in which time span this probably was composed or who is the composer. In fact, in some cases, it's not even clear uh, from the historic records. In other cases, very simple. But that all means we need the ground truth, the manual annotation. <coughs> now, sometimes it can be already quite some work to have a data size of a few hundred data points. That can already be quite some work. On the other hand, we do our automatic features, and we get to a f feature space with different dimensions and millions of possibilities. So how can we train these millions of possibilities with a database of 100 data points? That's what people in this field call the curse of dimensionality. If you have too many dimensions, too many possibilities, you have not enough data to really train your system. In fact, that problem comes up in different places where you do automatic training, even in the Huffman codes for audio coding. We had this problem. 
and did some dirty tricks to get around it. Uh, here it's even more important. So you have data space reduction, then you have your actual models. You find to try to find clusters in your data. You train the system to recognize which cluster it uh, gets to. And then we can have distance measures and really do, for example, some rank list for results. So again, the three major steps in such uh, systems are feature acquisition. In audio, usually, the better the original audio quality, the better your system. But, of course, whether you have 96 kilohertz sampling frequency input material or 8 kilohertz sampling frequency input uh, material, it's more than a factor of 10 in your amount of data. So you have to do some compromise in a lot of cases. Then, as I said, feature space reduction, beware of the curse of dimensionality. In fact, I'm uh, not aware of any research in this field where this is just easy and we have enough reliable ground truth data. Same problem comes up in all these current media detection and recognition fields. So for example, for people recognizing uh, pictures, there are international competitions. And we had PhD work in Ilmenau uh, looking into the ground truth used there and the uh, way people compare to this ground truth and who ranked first or second in this competition. And with a lot of statistical analysis and very solid work, the result in the end was, oh, be cautious, these results are not reliable because our ground truth usually is not reliable enough. And the same is true in a lot of these uh, tasks in music information retrieval. And then there is machine learning. That's a field where currently still every few years new ideas come up. In fact, there's been uh, some back and forth between two paradigms which usually are used in connection with each other. There are people, whether it's speech recognition or music information retrieval or so on, which just say, okay, give me enough data, like millions, billions of data points, ground truth data with millions of data points, and let me run a deep neural networks or such, just do statistics and I can't answer any question. So that's the extreme of the just let's use the statistics way. And then there's the other idea to say, okay, this will not guarantee us good results. We need to know about the structure of the problem. We need to know some ideas about so-called mid-level features, like music is composed over time of different uh, notes and uh, different harmonics and so on. And if we take that into account, it will give us much better results in the end. So there are people who just think about semantics and people who just think about statistics. From my point of view, the truth is in the middle as often. You can't do without statistics. You need that to do the actual training of the systems. But at least in my experience and the experience of our group in Ilmenau, the more you have reliable knowledge about the semantics, about the structure of the problem, the easier it will become to get good results. But again, that's going on and on, and I think it's only a few months ago that I heard somebody, 
I think connected with Google, okay, they have tons of data <laughs> saying we don't need to know about the semantics at all, we just do statistics and can answer any question. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, anyway, to go back, we do things first similarly as in audio coding. We look at blocks of data, we have some window function, some block size, some window function, and a signal frame in the end. So it's short-term analysis. Uh, in fact, we can view a lot of the methods as filter banks again. Um, people have found new words in some cases, so Garbo wavelets are very similar to what we used to call um, uh, filter banks, uh, quadrature mirror based or uh, cascaded filter banks and of course uh, DFT, uh, DCT are there as well. So let's look at some of the tasks, looking at the timbre of sound, at the rhythm and the tonality and some of the features used. In fact one early feature uh, used many decades ago already is the zero crossing rate. In fact, which just have, having the right zero crossing rate, uh, you can do speech coding where you in a lot of cases recognize the speech again. <laughs> it's not high quality of course. Then RPC, spectral flatness, spectral centroid measures. So that's all low level features which means they are done often with short timing and they are relatively simple calculations. Can be amplitude and so on as well. Then there's features which are often derived from low level features which are called mid-level. In fact the distinguishing fact between mid-level and high level features is that Mid-level features are still uh, technical features and high-level features usually have a semantic meaning. So if you talk to a musician, they will recognize what instrumentation, what tempo, what rhythm patterns, what keys, what scales, what chords are. But the usual uh, musician will not recognize what a chromogram is or an enhanced pitch class, uh, pitch class profile is or a tempogram is or MALF frequency capsule coefficients are. So both are more complicated features but again uh, mid-level features already use some knowledge about the signal to find out what can be important there. Okay, spectrogram representations could be uniform in frequency or could be a logarithmic frequency axis. So here we have uh, some uh, time signal of uh, some signal over time with the frequencies for some instruments and you, uh, if you know this, can clearly recognize the different tones, the harmonics, as it changes over time. And again, here we get really fooled by lots of details, uh, not here because everything's happening at low frequencies. So it makes a lot of sense to have this logarithmic scaling. Of course then the harmonics no longer have a constant distance from each other. Again up we go in frequency and to the right we go in time. The color gives us the amplitude. That's a chromogram, spectrogram. And there are people who have seen so many of these that they re can recognize music from looking at the uh, spectrogram. <laughs> I wouldn't. Okay, let's take the simple version. Short time Fourier transform, DFT, and how it looks 
in a polyphonic piece of music and we still see the tempo somewhere in the time structure, um, yeah, we can look at the different types of signals. One is harmonic components. For example, bass, here we go really down in frequency, below, below 50 hertz, that's the frequencies which don't travel over our phone network. So we start at 300 hertz. And yes, if we start with a lower pitch, we have the harmonics, they are more close together. For a higher pitch, spectrum looks stretched, simple, trivial. Then we have the important notion of the pitch, the fundamental frequency. And the idea is playing one tone, I have a certain pitch associated. Practice is a bit more complicated. As we see here towards the end of the tone, on one hand, of course, the amount of harmonics changes over time, but then there can even be some change in pitch, some slight change in pitch. On purpose or not on purpose, but again, that makes it more difficult to really detect actual pitch. And in speech coding, uh, certain algorithms really need a pitch detection and there's been work over the decades to do better pitch detection. And the requirements for music information retrieval are somewhat different from the ones in speech coding. So people again develop new ideas how to do the pitch detection. Of course, in the end, if we can do that, we might be able to get the main melody of a signal just from getting the right pitches for the loudest part of the signal. That sounds easy. In fact, there's a lot of pitfalls in there. Then percussive components. Yeah, that's basics, time frequency uh, behavior. If it's sudden in time, it means it's constant over frequency. So there you need to know your basic mass a little bit and you see it very well here. Here we have some percussion instruments and it's really nearly wide spectrum as it looks like here. Okay, more energy at the lower frequencies but it's really boom, 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 uh, always uh, at a certain time, flat spectrum, relatively flat. That's just to remind you of some of the mathematical basics for that. Okay, and we, if we get everything back together again, uh, it looks like this. And from that we already have the impression that uh -oh, to really get back all the score, all the ideas, which instruments play at which amplitude and which timing might not be trivial. Let's look at uh, one example for the mid-level audio features, uh, which is something used in the speech community for a long time. So, malfrequency capsule coefficients uh, is something which has been around, I think, at least for 35 years, if not longer. Um, the idea really is to get some information about the envelope on one hand and the fine structure on the other hand. And if you do first the DFT, do the magnitude, the logarithm, and then again the DCT, you get these structures. <coughs> With that, from the DCT, you get the envelope, and again, subtracting that, you get the fine structure. So MFCC a nice way to get some parameters of how a signal looks like. 
again, idea is very old. And in terms of actual calculation, you have your pre-processing, windowing, doing fast computation of the DFT via FFT, do the logarithm, uh, then have the, if it's mal frequency, you have uh, the order of so-called uh, mal, that's a different, not uniform, but different frequency scale, average to the DCT and you get your MFCCs. That's the way in this case to actually calculate it. Okay, let's put everything together for <coughs> automatic music transcription. So we have our signal, we do pre-processing, we do some way, again, different authors, different groups in the world use different ideas. Um, one thing uh, our group has been very successful with uh, is to use not just DFT, uh, but a multi resolution DFT, doing it at different resolutions at the same time and using these results. <coughs> different ways to do that. This multi-resolution DFT has been very successful and in fact not just for the picture recognition but in the MIR field, music information retrieval, uh, there's a yearly competition of who can do certain tasks best, always run by a different one of the groups in the world, uh, and um, in the task of finding the main melody in polyphonic music, uh, one of our PhD candidates uh, has nearly every time in the last five, six years uh, won this competition. So she's a world champion. Okay, so we do this transform, we do a decomposition, uh, look at the harmonics. Again, this looks very simple, very clean. Usually it isn't. That's a nice case here. Even then, F0 is uh, often the description of the pitch, the lowest harmonics, and you see that even in such a case doesn't look so nice anymore. You have to do some rounding and it's not that clear how it works. And then in the end you try to organize that What's very important here to do the right segmentation as well, to have some idea when tone starts and ends and so on. This will help you uh, quite a bit and you can get back to a musical score. Okay, let's go to the third part. No, we are still in machine learning. That's not yet the um, actual machine learning part in the end, but that's the feature space reduction. And there, uh, there are few ideas working which have been around for a long, long time. Again, in the end, you will want to find clusters and separate them. But first, the question is, what is a meaningful feature space? <coughs> and one idea there is really using main axis transform, as we call it in linear algebra. Here it's principal component uh, analysis, and that's just looking at the cross correlation, doing the, uh, looking for the eigenvalues and the direction, the eigenvectors give you the directions of the most important components in this n-dimensional feature space and from n dimensions you can reduce to say, okay, the energy in my signal is mostly determined by these two or five or seven directions. That's feature space reduction using PCA. <coughs> so the mathematics should be clear from what we hear in linear algebra early on at the university. 
Uh, I have to admit, in my case, it didn't work out that way. It was many years later until I understood it. <laughs> um, but once you do that, it's very simple. So then we have the so-called linear discriminant analysis, which already looks uh, uh, for the other directions. LDA direction uh, tries to separate different parts of the feature space. So that's uh, not looking to the overall most important, most biggest parts of the energy, but tries to minimize the variance within the classes and maximize the variance between classes. That's already something using uh, ground truth, so it's machine learning, without having some knowledge about the classes beforehand, you can't separate them. <coughs> but it can give you very good separation of classes. Let's look at more of these basic ideas used in machine learning. From simple to more complex, and again, in addition, but not in these slides, uh, neural networks after having very quiet uh, time of development for many years. Uh, there was a time uh, in the 80s where people thought neural networks will solve all problems. They found out they didn't. There were few special problems where they could be used with a very good advantage, and otherwise it became quieter. Now they are back with so-called deep learning, and that's, in fact, lots of statistics. You need lots of data to do that, but then it's much more stable than it was 30 years ago. <coughs> But not so much about deep learning here, but starting with k nearest neighbors. Simple idea, we need to find out which, how many classes we have, and we do some testing for each test data item, locates the k closest training data items, do some distance measure, simplest Euclidean distance, but it can be the maximum absolute value, Manhattan distance, cosine distance, or whatever, and then return the dominant label amongst that k items, and if you repeat that, you get to a good selection into a certain number of clusters. Then, again, something which is a bit newer, but nowadays, especially in the speech field, very common Gaussian mixture models. We all know Gaussian statistics. If we have the right conditions, then we can describe things with just mean and variance. And we know that uh, in nature, a lot of processes will have Gaussian distribution, the more single reasons there are for something uh, which is um, <clears throat> measured, the higher the probability to get actual Gaussian distribution, and we can do some very simple, nice optimization. So that's heaven for everybody who wants to use some classical linear algebra optimization algorithms to get a theoretical optimum. Just nature is not always that simple. So next idea was you can stack one Gaussian model on another one and get to so-called weighted mixture of Gaussians and Gaussian mixture models. So that works for other probability density functions which go beyond simple Gaussian distribution, uh, but still gives you a nice way to model some statistics with a very small number of parameters. And while Gaussian distribution is already very commonplace, the possibility to model something with Gaussian mixture models is even more universal. 
Okay. So, to do training there, again, what we want to do is to estimate the parameters to get our model. Again, the idea is if we have a model, we have a very small number of parameters to describe that. So the idea is for test data to calculate the probabilities for all GMMs which belong to this class and then pick the class with the highest probability. And for the development stage, of course, it's important of how many of these models we have in there, how many uh, Gaussian distributions are used to together get us to the Gaussian mixture model. Here there's one pitfall, something you should be careful about, which is similar to the curse of dimensionality I mentioned earlier on. With a lot of these models, if you do training and you have a small number of samples in your ground truth, you can do overfitting. What does overfitting mean? Overfitting means that you have enough parameters in your model to actually do an accurate representation for this data set and nothing else. It's no longer statistics. It's something which was learned for this case. In fact, overfitting in different ways can happen in a lot of instances. So, of course, you try to optimize something, you add new parameters, it gets better and better and better, but you lose the possibility to generalize the results. That's overfitting. Okay, let's look back. What are different tasks in music information retrieval? So, down there in the right, the nicest thing we could have, automatic transcription get music in score language out. Again, it works relatively reliable these days. Something I didn't think possible 10 years ago. Then, for the music lovers, we have the genre recognition. Uh, there is some uh, sets of genres uh, with, done with the support of music industry but again, it's not clearly defined. And then, yeah, for one of these companies, uh, we provided them with our uh, setup for music recognition, and they told us, oh, we have a problem. There is one genre you can't recognize. And they told us this genre is oldie, everything older than 30 years. Yeah, there's no musical description of what a goldie is. It's only defined by knowledge about the date of actual composition and the date it was played. And that's not in the ground truth data. In fact, uh, of course, if you have a big database with annotation, then that's uh, that simple. But just from the music, uh, it's by definition not possible because we know some contemporary musicians play music in the style of 40 years ago. Now, what does it belong to? <laughs> its year is 2014, for example. It's played in the style of uh, 1970s. Mm -hmm. Is it oldie or not? So, genre is Difficult to define, but still very important in a lot of application cases. Then we have the beat. That's interesting, for example, for DJs to find the beat auto automatically to find similar pieces so they can get from one to other. We have instrument recognition. In fact, that is more difficult than the automatic description, uh, uh, transcription in the moment. There's some instruments which are easier to detect and some which are more difficult. Singing voice. Uh, we would like to determine who sings something. We 
can't do yet, sorry. <laughs> um, harmonies, we can do a quite nice job already to find the harmonies. Rüssen, in fact, already 10 years ago we could do a quite nice job. Musical segments, like what's the uh, part which is repeated over and over again, or to get so-called uh, <clears throat> musical fingerprints, or parts which can be used to recognize. Like in a big database, people want to have samples which can be pre-listened, and that should be Often it's okay to take the start of a musical piece, but that doesn't work always. So really, what's characteristic for this piece of music? To find the internal structure of music, when it's repeated over again, whether we have the simple structures. In fact, that's a field where you have advantage if you know enough about musicology. In classical music, you have all these standard sets and repetitions and all that. But the same thing you have in a lot of popular music. Um, by the way, uh, for genre recognition, I had, have an, another long-standing example where this can go wrong. I think a lot of you will recognize the song Obladi Oblada by the Beatles. Very simple melody, very clear structure, always repeating, and it's the same like children's songs, children's songs all over the world. So if the system tells you this is not pop music, but it's a children's song like Hänschen Klein or all that, or Alle meine Entchen, that's some German examples, but these are available in all languages. Uh, the system actually, in some sense, is right. It just should recognize that it's the Beatles singing, and then it knows, OK, it's some historic pop music. OK, one other. Yeah, I uh, didn't want to go into much detail how to analyze the results of such, such systems. Uh, there's Usually, uh, precision, recall, F measure, and accuracy as measures to determine whether some recognition task has been uh, successful or not. That these are several measures um, has a reason that we have the recognition task, and we have, of course, the two positives where something is recognized. But we can have false positives, where the system thinks it has rec uh, recognized something, but it's not there. Uh, it can be the other way around. So that's these different measures with precision, recall. F measure is a mixture of these both. And then accuracy is the total number of correct recognitions in the end. So that's measures. Then often, if you have different classes, uh, you have confusion matrices. So on the diagonal, you have everything which is correctly recognized. Uh, here, it's recognizing instruments. And we can see for piano in this experiment, it worked very well. 93.5% accuracy. But then we have certain confusions, uh, like if we have instruments with similar physical uh, ways of sound production, like flute and trumpet and saxophone, or like different types of guitar, then you get more inaccuracies, you get confusions at some point. OK, one demo, what's been possible with that? Uh, in fact, that's with some spin-off company, a commercial product nowadays. 
But if that company just would have developed this technology from ground, it would never be uh, possible to get the investment back. So songs to see for us is a symbol of what can be done these days. And the idea is to have a system which lets you uh, train musical instruments. Okay, I don't have a guitar with me. There's other such programs which use some special instrument directly connected to the computer. Here everything works via the microphone built in here. So you can have a real instrument, you see the score, you can do slow-mo uh, to give you more time to find the right tones, you can have more complicated songs or simpler ones, and it will tell you uh, how accurate the uh, actual pitch was done and uh, whether your timing is right and so on. If you do that for guitar, it even can show you uh, how to do this on the guitar. If it's done for piano, you see a little piano keyboard before you that lets you find the right keys and so on. And yeah, let's just do that. And okay, I will try a very simple song. We have a little um, selection of songs in here, but let's get with that. <laughs> Trust me, I'm not a good singer. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, that's how it works. And in fact, it has one mode, which I don't have here to demo, but uh, has all the results about automatic transcription in it. Because you can learn to play your instrument with your favorite music. So you need some MP3 or RAV file or such. And then it does an automatic transcription to score. It's not 100% accurate. So better if you have a bit of uh, musical education and can correct something. But overall, it's quite nice. And especially, it's very good at finding the main melody. And with that, you can use your own favorite music to train your instrument train singing or playing. In fact, we have piano, we have guitar, we have saxophone because uh, one lady doing her PhD work on this is a saxophone player. Uh, flute, so some possible instruments. I think you, we have here a list, yeah. Guitar, bass, piano, saxophone, trumpet, clarinet, flute, ukulele, violin, maybe something more in the future. And we can have different songs here. Okay, that's classical. Hmm, I think that will be difficult. Especially singing the bass. So you have all kinds of music coming with it already, and then you can add your own. That's just an example of what can be done today. And again, there's a number of groups in the world working on such systems. Okay, so much for this. Now in the there's two more parts, one again immersive audio. Again, you heard something about this yesterday already. So yes, we've seen that. The problem we've had in the past was either no spatial audio at all, two-channel stereo,
But then we have this problem with the smith spot, which is for five channel, really in the middle, and okay, which is usually not where we sit at home. And in the cinema, maybe it's even worse because uh, the sweet spot is there for only a few people. In fact, in cinema up to today, because of this sweet spot problem and otherwise you get wrong directions, dialogue is mixed as mono. In cinema, you have usually uh, the combination of some music to get the emotion in there to have the feelings where you are and so on, which can be all over the place. In fact, it's diffuse, often it's diffuse to the sides and to the front. Then you have some effects, but a relatively small number, uh, which are at different directions of the stereo bandwidth. And dialogue usually is mixed to the middle because that will stay in the middle if you do 5.1 reproduction for everybody in the room. If it's not mixed into the middle, then you will have different impressions for different people. So that's another reason why more loudspeakers with better technology will help in the future. So again, I think I don't know whether we have the same people here again. I was yesterday asking for Star Trek fans. Identify. <laughs> yes. A few. So you know the holodeck. Yeah. And the holodeck is a nice symbol uh, of a lot of what people try to do these days, both in video as in audio. In video, we have, OK, we have the Oculus Rift and other virtual reality. Uh, systems, we have caves again with virtual reality, we have people trying to do holograph real holographic uh, reproduction with lasers, uh, with some fork, there's a company using fork and doing laser reproduction of 3D scenes in there. There's a lot of activity in video as well and in audio in fact we are quite advanced with some simple tricks uh, which uh, in fact are deviation from what we originally did in audio coding. There, everything was about perception. The systems used in audio these days for 3D audio uh, are a lot based of a physical recreation of the wave field. Uh, so there's a number of systems over time and ambisonics, uh, anybody here who has listened to an ambisonic system? No. That's interesting. They get, in fact, in terms of relative uh, number of uh, research groups um, thinking ambisonics is the best, they outnumber the other systems by two to one or, or four to one even. And it's relatively old technology. So it's been around for a long time. People have said this is the way to go. In practice, there are some problems which make it not so easy. So my view of things, which again is doubted by others, so it's certainly not the truth because it's not out there. Not, we are still in development. But my take on the things was ambisonics is a nicer mathematics, but gives you more problems in reality. And for wave field synthesis, which I will introduce in a moment, uh, we have five reasons why it shouldn't work in reality, but you can get great demos. <laughs> okay, ambisonics is spherical harmonics. So as I said, very nice clean mathematics. Do the development to different orders. And again, the higher the order, the more accurate will be the recreation of the wave field. And with higher order ambisonics, in the end, you don't have a sweet spot problem anymore because it works in a full area. If you take these 
two ways of doing things. Wave field synthesis and ambisonics both come down to the same mathematics in the end. They are just different types of solutions of the wave to the wave equation. So at some point they meet, but in practice there are differences. And MPEG-H, as I mentioned earlier, has the possibility to use both in there. So MPEG-H has the, all the formulas to translate from one version to the other and the rendering methods to do both. Okay, wave field synthesis. Again, uh, I still talk about wave field synthesis because it's a nice concept to explain. In reality, we don't use the same formulas anymore. In reality, there's some deviation, so that's no longer really wave field synthesis uh, we are doing in current systems. Goes back in physics, uh, you know the uh, idea that you can get the wave field uh, from one source and having secondary sources from other sources and the superposition will get you the same wave field. And uh, some 30 years ago or more in Delft, somebody working on seismic exploration for the oil industry. Uh, they have little explosions and a lot of microphones to get a picture of the ground. And he thought, okay, can't we use these ideas not just to analyze but to synthesize? And that was the starting point for the, all the current work on wave field synthesis just using many sources to synthesize the sound that it, it's more accurate in a room. So again, simple idea, primary source, lots of secondary sources uh, in the superposition give you the same wave field. Sometimes it's called wave font synthesis as well. Mathematically, you get the Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral which tells you if you know all the uh, pressure density functions components on a sphere, uh, there's an integral over all that which gives you the pressure at any point. That's a simple explanation for that. Which means if I have an infinitely dense sphere of loudspeakers, I can reproduce any sound field accurately. Doesn't sound very practical. In and out, yes. In and out, recreates the full sound field. Then there are the so-called green functions and so on, a lot of mathematics which has been done and redone quite sometimes in a lot of PhD work in Delft, in Ilmenau and in, at other places. And the result is on one hand, if of these two components, in fact we can look at them one as a monopole and the other, the other one as a dipole component, if we leave out the dipole component, our calculation is still correct inside no longer outside. There we get some image uh, of the wave field, it's no longer correct. Which is good enough if we have our densely packed loudspeakers outside. Next is sampling. Densely packed, of course, is something we can't do. Packing them close enough uh, that we are uh, at uh, a distance lower than a wavelength is no, not practical either. We can't do it. So the question is, is it still okay if we sample with distances which are lower than the wavelengths for the frequencies where, remember what I said earlier, we mostly listen to the time and phase differences for our spatial hearing. 
So we use that very same frequency around 1.5, 1.7 kilohertz to say, okay, up to this frequency, we need to more accurately recreate all the phases. And in fact, that gives us nice results. Above these frequencies, we have so-called spatial aliasing. Depending on direction, we have different amount of spatial aliases as well, of direction of where the sound should come from in theory. Um, yeah, we still have this problem of a sphere. Next simplification, okay, let's just take a line of loudspeakers and in newer systems take a line and some additional height loudspeakers to get some real sound from above. Which means something which was simulated as a plane wave is no longer a plane wave because we have a line of loudspeakers. It's in reality a cylindrical wave. Our original model assumption was that we get the right pressure at every point in the room. From a cylindrical wave, it's not as bad as a point source, but still we get a reduction in amplitude. So we have the so-called receiving line, some point or some line where we get, where we do the calculations that uh, all the loudness parameters are correct there, and it will not be exactly correct at the other places. So these are the simplifications. In fact, you get more effects. If you don't have the full line, but you have some holes in there, you get in, again effects. <coughs> and so on and so on. A number of reasons why it doesn't feel like it works. Listen to it this evening, time lab at Heinrich Herz Institute. There is such a system, a ring of loudspeakers, and I can promise you, you'll get some great demos. Okay, so again, the practical way of doing it Originally, large number of separately controlled loudspeakers. In fact, we found, on one hand, people were angry about having hundreds of loudspeakers in a room. I think in Berlin at the Technische Universität, uh, there's one uh, big room with, I think, 600 loudspeakers. They have such a system as well. Uh, so newer versions of the system do a 1 over 8 sampling again, which means, means we have spatial aliasing uh, at much lower frequencies, uh, which means some of the effects are not as precise as they used to be. On the other hand, we have less problems with cone filtering artifacts and so on, wrong timbre and so on. So overall, people are happier with these modified versions than they've been with the original one. But again, we have the large number of loudspeakers creating a wave field within the listening area, and then we perceive the sound as coming from a certain spot. And if we are in a well-damped room, we, this room wouldn't work. We, because that's additional reflections which would influence our hearing. But in a well-damped room, you really get great auditory illusion with that. For the purpose of uh, producing content in such systems, uh, we have three basic types of sources which we then used to do delay and uh, amplitude and get to the speakers and get these impressions. We have so-called point sources, which are stable located at some point, even if you walk around the room. So that's very important. Remember this evening, uh, if you have the possibilities, walk around the room and find that it's still stable. Uh, then we have so-called plane waves, which mean we have a simulation of something which is near in terms of fear, uh, filtering, but far away in terms of direction of the incoming waves. 
This gives you f the effect. I don't know whether they have it at HHI. If you have such a source and you walk around uh, along the loudspeakers, the source moves with you because it's always the same direction. And it sounds like it's near from the filtering, but it's the same angle, so it moves with you. And we can have something which especially people in Hollywood liked a lot. We have so-called focus sources. They have the wavefronts which uh, look exactly like a wavefront coming from a source in the room. Again, we have to take care of precedence effect so it doesn't work in all directions because if the sound comes earlier from a certain uh, direction, then you will detect that and you will not have the feeling the sound coming from the other direction. But otherwise, you can in fact localize the sound in a way that you can put a sound source to the head of one of the people in the room and we for example, whispering ghost, and if you uh, go to uh, some of the uh, parks in the US, uh, for example, in Disneyland, uh, there is some uh, of this technology implemented. Okay, so what can you do? In some sense, we get a sound hologram. So in the full room, we have the right idea. And we have a number of systems already running. In Germany, for example, in Bavaria Filmstadt, uh, you see the loudspeakers. We have seats which are moving, air blowing into your face. And all that is a very nice thing to get to. And we have the TCL Chinese equipped with many, many loudspeakers. Again, we don't need that many today anymore. We have in some universities places. Uh, I think yesterday I showed the pro uh, picture of the planetarium in Jena. So different planetarium have such systems. And we built such a system into a car just as a demo what could be done in car audio. And again, great demo, but we don't have the car here. Already many years ago in Switzerland, some people used that to get you uh, for a rowing machine, for people who have to strengthen their muscles again, uh, the complete virtual reality of rowing over the sea, including birds flying over them and everything both video and audio. And yeah, how should that look like at the home? Mm -hmm. That's a mock-up, putting some of these loudspeakers uh, into a restaurant and doing a picture, and that's not what people would like at their homes. <coughs> so here I have a similar picture from our booth from a couple of years back at IFA. Uh, since you can't put that many large loudspeakers at the walls, we were working on flat panel loudspeakers. So with these, you can have the, flat, the loudspeakers at the wall and they are not even recognizable as loudspeakers, look like a picture or such. Okay, last part. Just getting into a bit more detail of what I told you yesterday already. Question is how to create perfect audio illusion. Wavefield synthesis was a physics-centered view. In psychoacoustics we can learn a lot of how spatial hearing works. We got just two ears. Okay, so that means we have the cone of confusions because if we look at time uh, delays or amplitude delays, it's a whole cone where we have the same data. So there's something more which should help us. And this something more is the filtering of the signal coming into our ears. In fact, even with one ear, we have some possibility to hear direction of a sound source. 
because sound coming from a direction gets filtered by our pinner, ear canal, head, a little bit of the torso. <coughs> if you remember in hi-fi technology, we try to have flat frequency response to 0 0.1 decibel. Okay, sound coming into our ears, depending on directions, has differences as large as 20 decibel. So in reality, if you turn your head to listen to something or somebody, the sound coming into your ear changes constantly. And it's not small changes. It changes which, by all we do in listening tests, should be clearly audible. So that's our brain correcting for that. And that's our brain knowing from experience human voice in this distance should have this type of spectrum. Okay, it's changed a bit, so it must come from a certain direction. So that's one, the, the monoral way of listening to sounds, head-related transfer functions. <coughs> and a simpler way to look at that, and especially for height, is the so-called blowout bands. That again, different spectrum depending on where the sound comes from is recognized by the brain and is translated into uh, the into perceiving uh, location, for example, above our head. That can be used in wave field synthesis to have the ring of loudspeakers and still hear the helicopter being there above us and not below us. But it's still better to have separate loudspeakers up there. So it's not that exact reproduction. Okay. Blind people use these effects, uh, including the pattern of reflections, in a very good way. And we can recognize rooms from listening to reflections. Some people even can draw the geometry of the room. Uh, it's not fully clear how we do that, in fact. There are different theories. Some people think about very simple cues, which are there or not there. Another theory is that in our brain we are building an acoustic representation of a room. What we know is that our brain analyzes the change of the spectrum of the sound and the sound of the reflections. We always think we hear only this direct source. That's what we really have the feeling. First incident of the sound, direct sound, that's where it comes from. But our brain uses all the other parts as well. And if you want to explain that to people who don't know anything about technology, you can say, okay, we know that bats recognize the environment from ultrasound. We are all a little bit like bats. We don't know it, but we can do it. <laughs> and of course, that's the problem then with wave field synthesis systems. Getting the reflections, our brain says, oh, you wanted to play a sound which is outside 20 meters. That's not true, this is a loudspeaker. So it works best without reflections. Okay, you heard about the McGurk effect uh, and similar, about how spatial hearing works, and we'll have a lot of research in that area still to be done. So for example, a lot of these cognitive effects, which are in the higher layers of our brain, can we still quantify them in some way? Uh, as an engineer who wants to do a sound reproduction system, I want really numbers. What reflection is good and what is not, and how many loudspeakers do I need and all that. We can't really do that yet. We have some feeling it's getting better and better, but we don't know yet. How accurately do we need to recreate the waveforms? Is it really some cues? People do multi-channel transmission today was basically a mono signal and many cues. And 
you can get great demos with that, and there are some people in the industries who say, oh, but you're missing a lot of important data, and it works in some cases and not in others. Is it possible to cancel room reflections? Because that's, of course, what we would hope there. We can, of course, do all the acoustic active material to the walls, have a perfect uh, anechoic room, but the other way would do to really have active elements, to use the same loudspeakers who get the sound to us to help with that. We are not yet there. People have tried. Can we quantify how our brain learns to adapt to acoustic feeders? And that's a very important question. Okay, one last example. Um, listening over headphones and I think I told you about the basic idea yesterday, but here a little bit more detail. Um, we have these systems, in fact there are some at the show floor as well, where you get headphones, you have head tracking, and uh, depending on how you turn your head, you have, if it works well, outside location of sound. Normally, with normal headphones, uh, you turn your head, nothing changes, your brain is so smart, it says it must be from within the head. <clears throat> so the question is, what are the parameters? When does externalization work and when doesn't it work? Because there are many possibilities. You, we can have... Uh, better head-related transfer functions. We can have them individualized to the test subject, not some mean values. Uh, we can have additional room simulation in there, and so on and so on. There's a number of possibilities. What does it need? And the experiment, in which in fact came from an old uh, idea, people have got examples of that happening over and over, but in literature you couldn't find it because it was not clear experiments. And that was that in some circumstances, uh, taking on headphones and listening to some stereo signal, you get perfect illusion, and in other circumstances not. And especially you get, in a number of cases, this much better illusion if you listen to the signal in the same room where the recording was done. So everything fits. The uh, pattern of reflections you have been listening to before and the pattern of reflections in your simulations are the same. And that helps a lot to get better illusion. So. That was an observation done a couple of times by different people, and we've done some experiments to that with different room simulations. Not exactly the same room, but as well similar rooms, dry room, uh, one with a lot of reflections, and just testing uh, what the actual uh, externalization, what do people tell us where is the sound coming from, far away or near the head. And the uh, reflection characteristics, room characteristics, reverb time in one of the rooms were 0 0.2 kilo, uh, seconds, relatively dry. The other one was 1.4 seconds, a lot of reflections. And the result in the end, if you do the test in the dry room. If you have simulation of the dry room, it works not perfect, but quite nicely. Simulation of the other room, not. Vice versa, a bit better, because the wet room with lots of reflections is better to recognize, but still, if you have the same room simulated, as the one you are sitting in, you get clearly, statistically significant, better externalization. 
again, different positions tested and so on. So you have to think twice about that. The same signals to your ear when sitting in different rooms gives you a different impression of a room, different simulation. So you can read even in current textbooks uh, the uh, theorem of binaural hearing that you need to have the right signals at the eardrums to get recreation of some sound signals. Unfortunately, this is not true. In some cases it works, in other cases it doesn't. It's more to it. The question is what is there? So what's the reason for it? Can be different ideas. There can be bone transmission of sound. I don't think really because that has a much lower efficiency so the reflections are not enough to really get into the ear by bone transmission. Visual cues are certainly important. We did some newer experiments and we found, okay, 30% roughly of that uh, observations can be explained by the visual change, by having people blinded or not and so on. But what certainly a large factor is that the brain remembers the acoustic environment from listening to the reflections to the wall. So we have some idea, there have been other experiments uh, showing how long this is, how long we require, uh, rem uh, we uh, really remember this acoustic environment. So there's still some more research to be done, but uh, we know for spatial reproduction, unfortunately for some people, things are more complicated, uh, even more complicated. Okay. Speaking of complicated, uh, let me conclude. There is more to be done. The quest for the ultimate sound reproduction continues. Quite some tasks we can consider being resolved. So if you have even not so expensive audio equipment in terms of amplifiers and storage connected to good loudspeakers, that's great. If they are if they have great modern design, which you like, they will sound even better. Some applications of signal processing into audio reproduction are just entering the marketplace, and in some cases we even still lack some of the basic knowledge. There's more DFG-sponsored projects to be done. Whenever listening is involved, we need more knowledge about cognition. And that's to all electrical engineers here for training. Optimization for mean square error is very misleading. Sometimes it goes exactly in the opposite direction to less perceived sound quality. So our brain is not an LTI system, neither linear nor time invariant. So we all learned a lot about LTI systems and how to characterize them and so on. We now find out, oh, there are certain application areas where that helps only a little, little bit, but we shouldn't just follow this path. If we optimize in that way, we might go completely wrong. And the final sense, it's been a privilege to work on such topics and I always enjoyed having to professionally listen to music. And uh, in fact, uh, if I look at the current group of uh, scientific staff and students, they seem to enjoy it the same way. It's a great topic. That concludes the talk. Okay, any questions? Not any questions. I would thank you very much. This was, mm -hmm. for, me, for me personally, it was the highlight of the conference. <laughs> not over. Thank you very much. Welcome. Are there any questions? 
Okay, I'll be here for a few minutes and then. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Brandon Burke. It was a very interesting, uh, interesting tutorial. Thank you for that. Uh, just had one question regarding actually the audio feature extractions that uh, you have. So, uh, uh, so I come from basically a summarization background. So where we have to actually basically summarize uh, the mm -hmm. audio as yeah. well as the video content. Yes. And uh, we have been working on video summarization algorithms. And uh, on actually the audio summarization, we had initially explored into that area because obviously because mm -hmm. of the actually the lower bit rate, it's, it's far easier to do it on audio. Yeah. However, uh, we found that, uh, well, actually we were advised by our IP guys that that MERL, that's Mitsubishi Research Labs, mm -hmm. they have a lot of... Uh, lot of patterns on uh, the audio feature extraction and the audio summarization related actually uh, I would say the techniques so uh, uh, so with uh, so that with that in mind uh, that the algorithms that you propose mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to know how exactly could we apply it into the summarization uh, I, I think we, we are not currently doing work on that but we've been doing work on summarization as well so just write me an email and I'll get you in contact with the people because that really would depend on the actual question to be solved and so on. Yeah. There's no simple answer. <laughs> okay.